Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Let's have a look at another game between Alpha Zero playing on the white end and Stockfish. So what opening do we have in this one? A D4 based opening. To be a bit more exact, we're working with a Queen's Indian defense. Black's prepared to Fianchetto, Queen Bishop. Let's sneak in one more move, G3. Now, of the 10 games that are out there between these two, Four of them saw E4-based openings. The other six, D4-based openings. The six D4-based openings all arrived at this exact position. And in every game, Alpha Zero was playing with white. What's one quick note we can take away from this? Well, when confronted with the Queen's Indian defense, Alpha Zero is a fan of Fianchettoing the King Bishop. The light square bishops competing now for the longest diagonal. Bishop b4 check. Bishop d2. And what to do with this guy? In this game, the bishop drops back to e7. Now, this little finesse, investment of two tempi with the dark square bishop. What has black accomplished? Well, it's known this guy here on d2 is not so well placed. Why can forget about Fianchettoing. The d2 square is now occupied. The n neither knight can make use of that square. Sometimes this would be desirable in this opening to reinforce c4. That can be sensitive now that the bishop has gone elsewhere. And one final note. The queen is now not able to see along the d-file as clearly. Sometimes white would like to play d5 and have the queen there to defend that square directly. Not now with the bishop in the way. Play continues with knight c3. Keep in mind this is a strength in the game, a pawn duo. It needs to be challenged at some point. And black can do that at this moment with d5. Let me show what would happen after d5. This isn't terrible for black, but I just want to highlight that the ratio in the center has changed. It's now tipping in white's favor, 2 to 1. Black doesn't want that, and so first prefaces d5 with c6. What's the difference? Well, after e4 and d5, now black is prepared to meet c takes d5 with c takes d5. And there you go. 2 to 2 ratio in the center is maintained. Now, this is an interesting moment in the game. A common continuation here, in reply to d5, you know, there's a threat on e4. A common continuation is to capture on d5 with the e-pawn, and after the recapture with the c-pawn, of course, that was the point, to follow up with knight to e5, to occupy e5 with a piece, a knight. And with this move, two pieces are helped, the knight and the bishop. Alpha Zero has a different idea in mind. This continuation is popular. As an example, the 2014 World Chess Championship match saw this in Game 5, Anand with White against Carlsen. Most recently, July of 2017, two top-level players, 2,700-plus players, played this line. Okay? Alpha Zero has a different idea in mind at this moment here. What is it? E5. Occupy E5 with a pawn grab some space and do so with a punch. Play continues with knight e4. Castles. It's at this stage that Stockfish now goes pawn hunting. Bishop to a6 follows. The pawn on c4 is now struck at twice and in a pin. He's going down. b3 is the reply. Before black can capture on c4, and black needs to address the pressure on e4, so the knights are exchanged. And only then, d takes c4. One more move, b4. I'd like to pause for a moment. This is the first position that really captured my attention when I cycled through this game for the first time. Just, you know, skimming through it, I thought, what is going on? White is down, not only is white down a pawn, but white has to now contend with, let me sneak one more move in there, 
White has to now contend with a protected pass pawn. That's not just any pawn, okay? If you're, I mean, if you're not experienced with the game, do just know that a protected passed pawn is a great asset in the game, uh, especially in endgame. Now, it's I know we're far away from an endgame stage. This is still a a rich middle game position, but come endgame phase, king and pawn endgame, this is basically like a win for black, having a protected passed pawn. So. Only 13 moves in, white's down a pawn, and it's a protected pass pawn of all pawns. Where is the compensation here? Well, in order to understand what white gets in return, we have to observe the pawn structure. This gives us a lot of information. The structure will influence the quality of the pieces. So we need to, po we need to observe some things here. The pawns that are fixed in particular for black, b5, c4, e6. And you might as well chalk up the c6 pawn as fixed as well. Where is he going? There's a nice grip over d5. You can never successfully play the c5 move, not at least without giving the pawn back. Okay? These pawns, what do they all have in common? Well, they're all in light squares. Guess who's influenced? This clown on a6, what's his future? Okay, this diagonal, this diagonal, this diagonal, no to all three. I don't see what he does for the rest of the game. That's the compensation. White has space with the e5 pawn, and this board is soon to be cut in half, and white is going to be able to attack on the king side and show that my light square bishop, his presence is felt. Your bishop is non-existent. Let's see how play continues. Knight d2. Okay. So the knight is heading for e4. He can't make use of e5. He's going to d2 and then e4. Black castles. Knight e2. Bishop b7. Queen g4. Notice the nice freedom of movement white has with this space. Having the e4 available for not only the knight, but we'll soon... Uh, we'll, we'll later see that the uh, the bishop can make use of that square as well. The queen has a nice home on g4, opposite the king, pinning a pawn. It's important to note that it's not only the light square bishop who is influenced in this position. That's, that's the clearest piece to see uh, being influenced, but it's also important to recognize that the bishop on e7, there are so many squares taken away from the dark square bishop as well, and the queen, what is her productive role going to be? Okay, the only productive role I can see is with a knight circling into the d5 square. Okay, let's see how white addresses this strong post on d5. Knight d7, knight c5. Okay, a little fork here. The knights are exchanged. Now, if the knights are not exchanged here, I'm not sure exactly how play would continue. A try is to play queen c7, avoid the knight exchange, and then circle in here. But in the game, we have the knight exchange straight away. And the continuation is d takes, uh, d4 takes knight. So the board is now cut in half. We have one open file, but the same situation is present. The bishop, the light square bishop, what is he going to do? This space is just so great that white has, this king side space. The protected pass pawn is, surprisingly enough, not, a, not an inconvenience to white. The bishop on c3 has that responsibility to make sure he doesn't bolt for a touchdown. And the bishop also has some influence as well on the king side, okay? This, if, if black tries to, you know, gain a little space or crack things open on the king side with, let's say, f6, well, the bishop is there to help influence that type of pawn break, okay? So it's not just a strictly defensive piece is what I'm getting at. He's not just there 
to keep a watchful eye over the protected pass pawn. No, he has some kingside influence as well, especially now that the d-pawn has captured on c5. Okay, so things open up a little bit on the queen side. The a-pawns are exchanged. One rook is exchanged. And now the first active move by black. Queen to d3. Okay, well, it's not fun to have to babysit the bishop, but rook to c1, soon this pressure will be alleviated. Rook a8, and it's very tempting to want to go in for bishop e4 here, but uh, not straight away. Instead, h4. This is a stabilizing move for who exactly? The queen. What do I mean by this? Well, if bishop e4 is tried straight away, the queen can be dislodged from her defense of the bishop with h5. And if the queen moves, we would have g5. She's getting chased away from defending the bishop. White does not want a queen exchange here. First, it's h4. Stabilize the queen post from these deflection ideas. And more long term, this is going to be a battering ram, that h-pawn, looking to inflict some pawn weakness or create some open file. It's first h4. And now the queen runs home. Okay, this captured my attention for sure. Why is, why is black voluntarily retreating without waiting for first bishop to e4? What would be a more active move? Certainly a move like rook to a2 in this position comes to mind. What would happen if rook a2 is played? Well, bishop e4. And if black attempts to exchange queens with queen to e2... White will say at this point, yeah, you know what, I will go for a queen exchange, because in the end, guess who's going to get trapped? Your rook. Look at these bishops. They are monsters. Okay, what squares are they not taking away from the rook on e2? The rook is dead in just a couple. So, the queen in this position runs back home. Bishop e4. Look at the squares the bishops are taking away. Even if a rook occupies, a black rook occupies the d-file, the bishops are killers. There's no good entry point for a black rook. Might as well cancel out d6 as well. Black has two squares to work with. Black is basically playing on two ranks of the board. White is controlling six. Queen c8, king g2, slow, steady progress for white basically passing slash nothing moves for black. I, I, how do you improve the pieces for black? How do you change the structure? There isn't a good way to change the structure. What does this mean? Black has to play within the structure, and the structure is no good. Queen c7 follows. Queen h5, provoking some weakness. g6 is the best way to defend. He's not around to watch over... Uh, the light squares, so the pawns need to have that responsibility. The bishop, the dark square bishop, is at least around to remedy the weaknesses now on f6 and h6. Queen g4. White now has something to bite at. Bishop f8, h5. So this little lift is now providing a quick transfer to the king's side. Rook d8. Open file, but where are the entry points? They don't exist. Queen h4, queen e7, and queen f6. Black could exchange queens, but this only makes life more difficult for team black. For example, if queen takes queen, if you thought things were bad for the, the black pieces with the pawn on e5, they just get even worse now. The pawn now can, takes control over two new squares in black's camp. So what's what's he going to do now? Okay? These these two pe the both bishops are dead. This is the only active piece, the rook, and he's just been dancing, you know, he's kind of flipping a coin. Do I want to go to the A file or the D file? Let's flip a coin. One piece is not going to be enough. Okay? There's no uh good coordination for black whatsoever. One active piece doesn't cut it. White has three active pieces, and soon the king's going to play an active role, or could play an active role in this position with the queens off. This is a great thorn 
in black side a pawn on f6. This isn't a type of position where we would go, oh, I don't want this to happen because I'd have double pawns. No. The pawn on f6 is of great value. So, queen e8 in the game. Rook h1, rook d7, h takes g. Black has to take away from the center. Taking like this, and pick your favorite way to give mate. So, f takes g6, taking away from the center. That makes this a bit sensitive. Queen h4, queen e7. White doesn't want a queen exchange now. Ideas of sacrifices are right around the corner. The queen is a super piece, tied in very well with the bishop. These three pieces are playing. This guy, not so much. But that's soon going to change. Rook d8, bishop to b2. Okay, can't go to d2. But now with bishop b2, he's looking to pivot on c1, and then sneak in here, and you can be sure his presence will be felt. Cutting in on this diagonal, looking to pivot on f6, that's a hole in black's camp. Soon, all the white pieces will be attacking the black king. And guess who's not around? This guy, he's garbage. Continuing, queen f7, bishop c1, and c3. You'll notice a spike in the evaluation with this last move. C3, it's, it says roughly equal at depth 22, 23, 24 now. Uh, and then after the C3 move, a big shift. Well, I let this position sit for a while until about depth 40. And other moves instead of C3, like making a rook move, to d7, kind of a, a sit-and-wait approach, which is basically all that black has been able to do for many moves now, eventually result in a similar evaluation of plus one, uh, yeah, of a, a similar evaluation plus one. So I would just like to highlight some other continuation besides c3, just to uh, emphasize the type of approach white can take uh, attacking the king. For example, rook to d7 here. Rook d7, there's this idea of rook h4. Let's say bishop c8. Bishop gets active. Let's say the rook comes over to a7. Queen to h3. So what is being set up here, let's just make one other passing move, just to illustrate this attacking idea. Look at this situation. Perfect battery, the bishop's knifing into the king position, and all of a sudden there is this tactic to capture on g6. We're seeing the point now with this little rook lift to h4. What would black do here? Taking with the pawn runs into mate. Taking with the queen at minimum runs into rook to g4, and there goes the queen. The short story here is that from this position, a sit-and-wait approach, just kind of dancing back and forth with the rook on the A file or the D file or making a bishop move, allows white to slowly build up to a point where a tactic is going to occur. Some type of sacrifice on G6 is right around the corner. So black tries to distract now, setting the protected pass pawn into motion. C3 in the game. Bishop e3, there's no rush with picking up this pawn. The bishop finds a secure square. All of the squares on the d-file are still under control. No great entry square for the rook. And at this stage, white simply drops back and scoops up that extra pawn. There's nothing that black can really do to prevent this. The material has been restored. And the positives still remain, of course, for Team White. This great space advantage and a terrible bishop. Queen d7. Rook c1. White wants to play bishop g5, but that would give black an opportunity to play queen to d4. It's still good for white, but white wants to keep the queens on for just a little bit more. So first uh, secures the queen position, and then bishop g5 is serious threatening the rook. The queen would be defended. This is the point with rook to c1. The queen is defended. 
So now this is a threat. Queen c7 in the game. Notice, uh, what do these two pieces do? These are the only safe squares for the major pieces. And any move by them, any, any move by the queen or rook is a demotion of that piece. Queen c7, bishop g5. There's no in-between shot of bishop takes pawn hitting the queen because bishop takes rook would be hitting the black queen. Rook f8, f4. Look at the transfer of the bishop. He's no longer needed on c3 to defend against the passed pawn. He has pivoted on b2, c1, g5, and he's eyeing up f6. Unlike black's bad bishop, we have white's bad bishop outside of this pawn chain, and look at how active he is, looking to post up on f6 next. h6, bishop f6 follows, dark square bishops are gone, queen f7, rook a1, queen takes pawn, queen takes queen, rook takes queen, material is balanced, or excuse me, material is no longer balanced, but look at the activity of the white pieces. Rook a7, bishop takes pawn. Now it is balanced, and it's going to stay, uh, well, white is not going to give away any other pawns. It's at this point that white simply mops up basically all black pawns in short order. Let's see how this, this is accomplished. Rook d7, king f2, white finds it much easier to activate the king in this endgame. And it is related to this space. It's related to this one piece tying down two black pieces. It's like white is playing with this free piece still, even in this simplified endgame. g4, bishop c8, rook a8, rook c7. Look at the giant knot that the black pieces are in. King e3, h5, giving away a pawn. Doing something other than that, such as king g7, the bishop plays to h5, and how do you untangle his black? Eventually black will find himself on, uh, black will be in Zugzwang. For example, king f6, king e4, if the king moves, the white king improves, and if the bishop moves, we have checks that can be given, king g7, rook to b8. King f6, you could even try rook g8. Yeah, this would be the right idea. To flush the king away from f6 and then sneak into e5, white will make progress one way or the other. So at this point, starts pitching some pawns in order to grant the king some squares. And one by one, these pawns are simply going to fall. C pawn is now gone. And soon the B pawn will be falling in this endgame as well. And not too long from now, we're going to have Team Black throw in the towel after move 68, Bishop to e2. Black resigns. So if the game did continue, this is just one of the many ways it could have finished straight to checkmate with a king and rook versus a king. Just showing that quickly. Not too many moves from now. Again, just one of many ways this game could have finished. So, what more to add with this one? Stockfish. Your protected pass pawn, even though an extra, was not the most important feature in our game. Most important was that the static structure granted me a space advantage on the king side. It was not only your light squared bishop, but also your dark squared bishop and queen whose mobility was negatively influenced by my space advantage. This space permitted me the time to arrange my two bishops, such that they dominate the whole board. Voluntarily entering into this type of pawn structure is known throughout the Alpha universe for its stupidity.